Alex Jones has just filed a motion for a new trial in the Texas lawsuit in which he lost a $50 million verdict against him uh, based on comments that he made uh, about the Sandy Hook shooting in Connecticut. He has filed a motion for new trial, which is something that you do in the trial court, asking for the court to basically give him a do-over. And he has also filed a notice of appeal, which is a notice saying that he uh, basically saying, I am telling you the court that I plan to file an appeal. He has not yet filed the appeal, but from his motion for new trial, we can get a pretty good idea of the kinds of legal issues that he's planning to raise. I'm Kevin Newper. I'm an attorney at Newper & Covey. And uh, I've been asked by some people, I do these videos on celebrity lawsuits. I got asked in the comments to do an up, uh, an analysis of the Alex Jones case. Uh, there are like four or five different cases going on right now, bankruptcies, uh, another case in Connecticut. And so I'm going to have to split this up uh, to even sort of try to grasp how complicated all this stuff is. But uh, the Texas case has some interesting developments uh, with this new trial motion and also with an effort to sanction uh, Alex Jones's attorneys, which is kind of asking the court to punish them for even filing this motion for a new trial. Uh, and I think this case just starting to take a look at it and look at all the maneuvering and bankruptcies is actually extremely interesting from a legal perspective and a good choice for me because I actually used to live in the same building as Alex Jones when I was in Austin. I was in the same apartment building as him. I don't have any really good stories of Alex Jones doing anything crazy in the apartment. He kind of just was a regular tenant there and was not quite as famous as he is currently, uh, I guess, nationwide, but he was an Austin figure and I saw him hang, uh, hanging out at the pool a lot. And that's about all I got to say about him from being in the same apartment building. Uh, but uh, in, in this video, I want to try to split this up a little bit and there'll be more videos uh, given how like painfully long is an attorney looking at some of these motions, uh, how long they are to even uh, walk through them. I'm going to start uh, here in this video with the motion for new trial. And if you're interested in does Alex Jones have a chance to sort of win his appeal, this is the first glimpse I think that we're getting at that. And then I'll do a follow-up video on the attorneys sort of spitting and fighting and clawing at one another over whether this uh, a new trial motion was a total disaster, and I'll maybe preview a little bit about what the uh, the plaintiffs' attorneys are saying about that in their motion for sanctions, which they just recently lost for the trial court. Now, if you know nothing whatsoever about Alex Jones and nothing whatsoever about this lawsuit, which is perfectly fine, you, you know, some people may not follow him that closely, I'm going to give you a little short intro just into what this is and what's going on and uh, why this basically could bankrupt this guy, <laughs> and he's currently in bankruptcy with some of his companies. Um, so Alex Jones is a uh, political commentator. He tends to lean more conservative, more right wing, although that's really uh, categorizing him as very difficult because he just has uh, kind of a eclectic views is maybe the nice way to put it. And I'll try to stay a little bit neutral, at least in terms of what's going on, because I know he has a lot of people who are really big fans of his and a lot of people who really, really hate him. And so uh, <laughs> trying to, you know, stay neutral when you're when you're given a commentary is a little hard, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so. He has. Uh, he started in Austin. He was on local public access television for a long time. Uh, if you don't know what public access television is, which some some people younger generation Zoomers don't, uh, used to be that we didn't have Netflix, we didn't have the internet, we just had these little TV stations broadcasting stuff around. You had maybe six or seven TV stations in any area, and there would be four or five big ones, and you would have a couple of really little ones with no access, no like they could only broadcast in the local city, but you could go pay. If you were a local uh, person there to like get your own TV show and uh, it was always kind of like oddballs, I guess is maybe the way to put it. Most most people who did this were the most boring, weird uh, shows possible. Alex Jones actually came out of that and was kind of entertaining uh, and got his own, uh, you know, started his own radio show and his own, uh, he has this site, website called Infowars. It's been around 20 some odd years, 25 or maybe 30 years now, getting close to it since he started the public access stuff. And he uh, as tends towards, people would call it more conspiracy theory type stuff uh, in some of the things he's saying. Some people would say uh, that, that's, that it's not conspiracy theory, that it's, you know, uh, uh, that some of the stuff he's saying is real. The, the one that we're uh, talking about in terms of this lawsuit is comments that he was making about a school shooting in Connecticut uh, at a school called, or in a town called Sandy Hook. And there were around 30 people died in the shooting. Uh, this this guy basically came into the school and just started shooting in an elementary school. So a lot of kids were di died at this. And Alex Jones for a while had denied that this was real. He said it was a government hoax, that the people who were uh, the parents who were appearing on television were what he called crisis actors. And a crisis actor is kind of a phrase for if the government fakes uh, some kind of event or, or whatever, then a crisis actor is supposedly someone who um, basically is hired to go kind of be a, a fake actor in one of these events. Now, there have been government events that have been faked. We know that in war, you know, there's things like that historically. 
um, but that's not really like a school shooting. That's uh, things like you know the Gulf of Tonkin, or uh, there's been situations where you know excuses to go have a war have been ginned up by the government. That is not something that's entirely out of the universe. But in this case, Alex Jones has admitted that he was wrong. That this this is not something like that. That this was a real school shooting. That he shouldn't have called these people crisis actors. They're real parents, and so the parents obviously were not happy after the deaths of their children having. Uh, somebody running around calling them crisis actors and saying that their kids weren't even real and that this whole thing was a fake uh, effort to try to like do gun control or something. Uh, so they, uh, have, many of them have started suing him, uh, not just in Texas. There's another effort at a lawsuit in Connecticut that hasn't uh, gone through yet. Um, and it may be paused a little bit for the, for, because of the bankruptcy stuff going on. Uh, that's a, you know, for another time. But I wanted to focus on this Texas lawsuit, which is just adding a little jump cut post uh, video for editing clarity is that uh, when I refer to this Connecticut lawsuit that hasn't gone through yet, there's one that has gone through, there, there's too many lawsuits to keep track of, one that has gone through where there's a $1.4 billion verdict. When I was making this comment about the one that hasn't, it's actually pretty recent, maybe a month ago or so ago, uh, there are more people trying to sue him in Connecticut. So that's sort of maybe on pause, is it going to keep going? Uh, but the, one, the $1.4 billion judgment that you've heard of that adds up to about $1.5 billion total when you have these text lawsuit plus the Connecticut lawsuit plus question mark from if the more parents suing him get to go in Connecticut as well for yet another lawsuit. So just to be clear and make sure everybody kind of understands how many lawsuits we're addressing here. And he is, he, after that verdict, uh, has, is fighting now to try to get a new trial. Uh, he is going to appeal this and, and, uh, he, he is alleged basically that he did not get a fair trial in the trial court because he says the judge was biased against him and various other, uh, that basically that all, this is kind of political according to him saying this is an effort to shut him down, to, to stop him from talking. Now, uh, probably for at least some of the plaintiffs, it is an effort to stop him from talking. Some, you know, being fair, I guess, to everybody is some of them don't want him. They, they don't like what he's saying. And so they want him to stop talking. His, his view is I've got a First Amendment right and I, you know, sh you shouldn't lose, use lawsuits to try to uh, shut me down. And then parents would, of course, respond and say, well, what you said was sort of outside the bounds of First Amendment because you defamed me by calling me fake and my child fake and all this. So it's a back and forth. Um, and uh, right now we're trying, the court's trying to decide, uh, the trial court's trying to decide, should I give him a new trial? That motion has not been decided yet as of today, uh, which is April 18th. Uh, and uh, the, the, will it grant it or not? I highly suspect I will say that the trial court does not grant a new trial. And that is not even anything to do with Alex Jones. It's just that um, it is very rare for that to happen at the trial court level. It's, it's frankly very rare at the appeals court level for that to happen. Although this case, because of the politics, may be sort of an odd duck in that respect. Um, but I would not expect the trial judge, the trial judge was not very sympathetic to Alex Jones, Jones uh, throughout the trial, uh, which is part of what he doesn't like about it. And, and uh, but even sort of in general, like courts, unless there's just sort of like a clean error, they're probably not going to do it uh, because they're the person who like handled the trial, right? So it's sort of on some level, attacking your own handling of the trial. And I think that's maybe even more enhanced here in this case. I'm going to walk you through this motion. It's a very long motion. One of the features of the state of Texas in their legal system, at least the state level, is they do not have limits on uh, page limits on how long motions can be. So this uh, motion is 50 pages. Uh, the, the local court, uh, courts can each make their own. They can set page limits if they want, but uh, many of them do not. And so uh, in most, most courts, you would have a much shorter motion. This is a very, very long one. Uh, but it will give us a lot of details into uh, what the thinking is in terms of uh, what, like, can he get out of this uh, on a, on an appeal if, if he goes up to the Texas Supreme Court, which politically uh, is much more right wing and much more at least I don't know if you'd call him on Alex Jones's side because, like I said, he's sort of eclectic, uh, but at least uh, on the a different side than most judges in Travis County, Texas, would be, which is where this is held. This trial happened in Austin. Austin is no, notorious for being very um, sort of more liberal than the rest of the state of Texas. And the judge and jury, I I would just rolling the dice or, or throwing a dart, you're going to hit a much more liberal uh, uh, judge and, and jury in that area. And it seems like that's probably something that happened. Uh, you get up to the state level and and they can be very, very conservative in terms of the Supreme Court justices. But so what is actually, what did Alex Jones file? What is Why is he trying to get this new trial? Let's look at the motion that he filed and what he's actually saying there. One one little aside is uh, that is not actually Alex Jones there. I use AI generated uh, images of, of of people whenever I'm doing the uh, little thumbnails for these videos. And I gave him some body armor because he got a little minor win this last week, which we'll talk about in one of the follow-up videos on his motion for sanctions. So he at least 
as as it's really more his lawyers that won that won than him. But he, you know, got to take what you can get after losing one point five billion dollars. And I'm also going to take one quick detour before going to this motion for a new trial. Uh, I'm going to preview the next video, what you're going to see in this, just because it. I think reading the first paragraph of this motion will set the stage for what uh, what the sides are arguing when you read the motion for a new trial. Now, this is the thing where I said he just got a little win. Uh, the the end order on this, this motion that we're looking at here is going to be denied. This is a motion that was, uh, this, this here is a motion that was for sanctions against Christopher uh, Martin and uh, and Dino Reynal, who are Alex Jones's attorneys. Uh, you can see at the top, this is what's called a case caption. Uh, they put this on all the documents just to tell the court kind of what, what is this, what case is it in, how to keep track of these documents. All, there's tons of paper being filed uh, in any, again, not just any lawsuit, but all the lawsuits. And you can see there's a table of contents. Uh, I'll be talking about that in a minute on the motion for new trial. And you can see this one is 50 pages and it's the motion for new trial is about the same. And what happened after Alex Jones filed that motion for new trial, which as of today, there has not been an answer filed or, or, or a response rather to the motion to the trial. So we know what Alex Jones is saying. We don't know what uh, the uh, plaintiffs in the case, the, the parents are going to say in response to that effort at a new trial yet, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. Um, but this motion for sanctions, so instead of responding to it, they basically just uh, started filing, asking for the court to sanction Alex Jones, a sanction, or, or sorry, his attorneys, a sanction is... Um, you, you file this motion that asks the court to basically punish someone. So sanctions are just a legal punishment for doing something wrong. And you can see that they, they are basically attacking the motion for new trial itself. They say it's, it was a groundless brief, and a brief is what we're looking at here. A brief is a written out argument, and they all kind of look in like this rough format. They say it was filed in bad faith, without reasonable inquiry, and for the purpose of harassment and delay. And that it is a sloppy, disrespectful mess. So I'm about to show you what they just, I wanted you to see this just so you can see what they're going to be saying about it. That we're about to be looking at a sloppy, disrespectful mess, according to the plaintiffs. And this paragraph says, the lack of professionalism in defendant's motion for new trial is jaw-dropping. Even by the bizarre standards of this case, the brief is riddled with typographical errors and nonsensical organization. The brief contains only five citations to the record in the entire motion consisting of scattered references to the trial transcript, which are placed at the end of some sections, and none have any relationship to the claims made in the preceding paragraphs. The entire brief is filled with wild assertions of fact with no support, and makes defamatory statements about five law firms and the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Texas Supreme Court. From start to finish, the brief is structured around a parade of false statements, ludicrous misrepresentations that could only result from an ignorance caused by counsel's bad faith and lack of reasonable inquiry. The brief is an insult to the plaintiffs, the court, and the people of Travis County. So. Uh, a little bit of <laughs> rhetoric there is what I would call it, I guess. Uh, I will say, you know, we're going to see uh, it's another 50 page brief. I'll show it to you in a second. And uh, the organization is a little bit hard to follow because it does not have what uh, we saw up there, which is a table of contents. When you have a 50 page brief, those are very, very helpful. Now, riddled with typographical errors and all this, um, I don't know. I was not immediately seeing some of those. We'll go look. I saw a few typos, but nothing that struck me as crazy. Uh, well, insult to the people of Travis County. I don't know about that either. Uh, new trials or motions are common. They happen in pretty much every case. Uh, I would have, be, would have been surprised not to see one filed if, if they're continuing to fight it or continue to appeal it. Uh, you do that to preserve error and just because serving error is, error is when you uh, want to make sure that you have sort of checked your legal box that you uh, don't like waive anything. So, like, so you don't go up to the appellate court and go, oh no, I, I, I had a basis to overturn the case and then I didn't say anything about it. So um this, this extreme, I don't know, I will say the trial, just as a preview of what I'll be talking about in the next video, uh, the trial court did deny without much comment this motion. There was some back and forth beforehand that you, a little bit of fireworks uh, about this motion for new trial, but to even understand it, first we have to look at the motion for new trial itself. Okay, this is the motion for new trial, and I think it gives us a lot of insight into what the legal strategy for the appeal is when we start looking through it. Um, and I will say, I do think uh, this strategy sort of long run... Um, in Texas, now just to distinguish, there's, uh, I think, a couple cases in Connecticut, one that went to a $1.4 billion verdict. Um, this one in Texas got $49 million, uh, and it's very important that $4 million or so of that is uh, what are called actual damages, which is what was found to be sort of the actual amount that the people were damaged. And then the rest of it, uh, about $45 million of the $50 million, is what's called punitive damages, which are damages designed to punish people. And it's extremely important for Alex Jones's legal strategy on the appeal 
And uh, it, I think it's also, it, it, it may be the similar strategy that he uses in Connecticut. Um, the results there may be very different, but but uh, I think that the that's because the, the state of Texas and the state of Connecticut are very different legal environments. I don't know. And, and frankly, he may succeed in Connecticut just because of the size of that, that verdict. Um, and what is that strategy that he's, I think, will be the main one and the one that he is most likely to succeed on? And I would say in Texas, he has a very high chance of reducing this, but not eliminating it. Um, so there is some controversy in different states over punitive damages. They are um, damages that, and it's gone up to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, previously, um, there, there uh, is, if you, if you notice kind of the math on this punitive damages in this uh, 4 million or so versus 45 million, that is roughly 10 times uh, the, the amount of the actual damages. And why is it roughly 10 times the amount? And I, it, the reason is that the U.S. Supreme Court has set kind of a, a rule of thumb guideline for punitive damages. They, these, these used to get uh, very, very high. You could potentially have someone win a dollar in actual damages and then win millions upon millions in punitive damages. And um, some of these outlier cases, they weren't like every case, but when it would happen, the Supreme Court kind of of the U.S. wanted to do something about it. So they said that there is this rule of thumb that um, the most uh, punitive damages, sort of the outer limit of what is normally constitutionally acceptable, like under the U.S. Constitution, given due process rights, given sort of your rights to a fair trial, the most that can generally be fair is 10 times the amount of the actual damages. So this amount is at the outer limits that the um, U.S. Supreme Court would allow. They, you know, there could be situations where it goes higher, but this is sort of, um, it would be very rare. <laughs> and and so in, in this case, uh, the judge uh, and the jury put Alex Jones's punitive damages up at the sort of absolute maximum that they could even try to do. Um, the problem is that they're in Texas. So Texas has a very different uh, approach to this. Texas, um, under state law, and state law is kind of what governs these defamation claims, um, they actually have a cap on punitive damages of $750,000. And the judge in this case kind of said, whatever, I'm ignoring that. I don't think that's constitutional, which which in and of itself, I think is going to be a problem. Uh, and, and part of the problem is that while that it, it gets all gets back to politics, this is a political case, and you're going to, you know, end up with politics in it. That's just sort of unavoidable. Um, the judge is appears to be a Democrat. Um, the, the Texas Supreme Court, as I said earlier, is literally every member of it, all nine members are Republicans. So you're going to have uh, nine probably pretty conservative Republicans deciding whether uh, these, this punitive damages amount that is at the very highest amount that the U.S. Supreme Court has, has said is okay, um, and it's beyond what Texas law says is okay by a significant portion, um, is the Texas Supreme Court... Uh, going to allow that to stand. Uh, there, the, it will go up to an appellate court first. Uh, that's the third uh, uh, third uh, court of appeals in um, uh, Austin, kind of in that area. And actually worked in law school for a judge on that. But they are also mostly Democrats. Uh, not, I don't think entirely, but uh, it, it was a very democratic court. So he, I think that the odds of this, if I were just sort of uh, wargaming out what's going to happen, um, I think that probably the there's a good chance that the four million-ish of, of actual damages stands and a good chance that uh, the rest of it gets knocked down to maybe, you know, 750,000, I think would probably be the bet. Um, if, if I had to, you know, put money down on what's going to happen, that's what I would say. Um, they, the appellate court can do what's called a remediator. Um, the trial court could do that as well, but it didn't look like they've, they've, they've asked for that. What is a remediator? Um, that is when a, instead of ordering a new trial, the court uh, or the court of appeals could say, look, um, you did this amount of damages, you know, it's too much. Um, I'm going to give you two options. One is you can take this amount of damages that I'm offering you. And then literally will be like, I think a fair amount would be, you know, $500,000 or whatever. That's just a made up number. Um, and so you can either say yes to that or you can go do a new trial, but you're not getting this high an amount anymore. And um, that's kind of a, uh, it, the appellate courts don't like ordering new trials because of just the cost and the time and all this. And so it's a way to avoid having to do a new trial by basically telling some, someone, some defendant who's appealing, like, look, or plaintiff, or really it's the plaintiff, I guess, who would be making this because their, their amount would be cut down. So you tell the plaintiff, uh, look, you know, you can, you can either take, take this number or you can go to your trial again and you'll probably get less than it and waste a bunch of time. And uh, they try to, you know, set the amount at something the plaintiff would want to say yes to. Um, and so that is what I think will happen. And I think we'll see a preview of what Alex Jones is trying to do with that here. Now, uh, if Alex Jones win, gets this down to $5 million, that's a big win for him. The reason being that he could actually pay that back. So if he's if he ends up with a total of like $1.5 billion or whatever in verdicts across all these cases, he's never going to pay that back. 
um, that, that, that becomes a very bad scenario for him. Um, if he can knock the amounts down to something that is within his sort of net worth and assets or, or within the amounts he could earn over a few years or whatever, um, then he survives. He lives to fight another day, keeps info wars, he keeps doing, you know, kind of keeps his life intact. So that I think is his, his uh, primary goal here is not necessarily, you know, win uh, and, and get rid of everything. But if you get it to some uh, number that's acceptable, then, OK, it's a loss, but it's not a fatal loss. So let's look at what they're saying in this, you know, what they, the plaintiff called a sloppy mess or whatever. I, I really don't think it's a sloppy. I think it's difficult with this lack of index, but uh, not as bad as has been claimed. If you've never seen a motion before or don't know what a motion is in terms of law. So when you have a lawsuit, um, you and, and this goes for like criminal cases, too, you would do this as well. You have these things called motions. Motions are, are when you go to the court and it's called moving the court to do something. So you are that's just a phrase they use to say, I am asking you to do something. I am moving and filing a motion for you to do whatever. And they'll generally look kind of like this. They'll have uh, this case caption at the top, which is all the stuff about names of the plaintiffs, names of the defendants, the district court it's in, in Travis County, Texas. You can see there's a lot of districts in Texas, pretty big state. And, and so uh, we love bragging about that all day. <laughs> but uh, then the defendant's motion for new trial or in the alternative motion to modify the judgment. So um, any motion you're going to kind of describe in the title, like what is it so that the judge knows what it is. And there's different kinds of motions that are pretty standard. Motion for new trial is a pretty standard one. Um, so could, if you're asking for something real unique, it could be some weird title, but um, this one is pretty, you're going to see this a lot. And uh, you see that the first thing they say, no index, okay? And that's that will become, you'll, you'll see why it's painful as we go through and also kind of like doesn't look like page numbers, which let me check. Okay, they do have it on the second page. Index and page numbers, if you ever become a lawyer, are very important uh, just because the actual way you use these, especially if it's 50 pages long, uh, you need to go find stuff <laughs> and and knowing like, hey, here's this specific page number to look at, always important. Um, and you can see they did that here. Like this is, uh, so kind of a side on what's called citation. So lawyers are, will have these little, you'll see these weird numbers in here. Um, that this tells the court where to find it. This is a Westlaw citation. So if you go take this number and copy it into something called Westlaw, there are two ways to search legal opinions that people use. One is Westlaw, the other is LexisNexis. You just copy this into this service that lawyers pay for, and then they can, like the case will pop up, this this other, totally different uh, lawsuit where the court wrote an opinion that on a legal issue. And uh, if you ever become a lawyer, one of the most important things that you always, always should learn is to use what are called pinpoint citations. So this tells you the exact page at that page. Uh, judges want you to do that. Their law clerks want you to do that because it is very hard to find things if you don't tell them where. So that's just an aside, because I know some, some people probably are wanting to be lawyers if they're watching me go into this amount of detail. Or, uh, you know, if you just get interested in trying to find stuff, this is how you would find it. You go look for the pinpoint. Um, so the first thing they're saying is like, look, this motion is timely. Uh, timely means that um, I filed it on time. And you can see there, it looks like they're filing it 32 days after the court signed the final judgment. Uh, I think that the reason they're saying this is because I think the amount is 30 days and there's some weekend that popped in the middle of this. So they are like, hey, uh, don't look at this and say it's 30 days and kick it back. Uh, they just want to prevent the court from uh, miscounting because uh, with stuff with like weekends and holidays, it can change the count for your deadlines. And uh, you don't want to like have some court make an error when it's something that's a little complicated and, and uh, you know, not the normal time period that you would look at. Like you can see down here, 30 days, motion, it's timely if it's filed within 30 days, but then the holiday or whatever, the weekend modifies it. Um, and usually use software to figure that out because that <laughs> I can tell you it's a pain in the behind. Um, and so they basically say, this is timely. Here's how you compute the time with these holidays. I'm just explaining this to you just as kind of an intro. And uh, then they get into the, the meat of it, which is the court should grant this motion for a new trial. And um, they say that uh, they start talking about the standard of review here. Um, and... And they're talking about sanctions. I think that the reason they're talking, this is part of the part where it's a little bit like uh, the organization is a little weird. Normally you would have uh, a standard of review for a new trial motion. And now they're talking about, they're jumping straight into argument about what they're going to be arguing here is that there was kind of a default on liability. You see that says here. So this is one of the things Alex Jones really doesn't like. And it's a big dispute in the case is that, um, and part of what the sanctions motion we'll get into in the next video is that Alec, the court 
uh, I think both these courts in Connecticut and Texas granted uh, default, a default on liability. What is a default? Um, a default is when the court, as, as a punishment for doing something or not doing something, uh, or, or just for not showing up, it's kind of like winning by default. Winning, uh, you know, you, you sh somebody doesn't show up or they don't do what they're supposed to, and so you, the court is like, okay, you lose. And, and that's why they call it the death penalty. You see the death penalty uh, in terms of the, the legal system to default someone is the kind of one of the more severe punishments that you can give. It usually has to be something, the conduct can't just be like minor. It, it's got to be something that is really bad. Um, you know, not participating in discovery at all would be very bad. And what, it, what, what is default on liability? Uh, all these terms you'll see I have to define it. Not everybody watches all my videos or whatever. And, uh, and frankly, even if you do, there's so much, like when I was a law student, I, I had index cards for every one of these words that I saw and I would just keep trying to memorize them. So repetition, it may sound repetitive if you do watch all my videos, but, uh, the, the repetition will help you learn and help me learn all this sort of new language. Essentially liability is there are two kind of parts of, um, a decision on any lawsuit liability is, are you liable uh, do you have to pay under the, the legal claims that are being made? So that's the kind of the first question is like, did you do something that makes you have to pay the other person? And the second question is, okay, if you are liable, if you did something that makes you owe the other person money, then how much should you have to pay? So liability and damages, two separate things. And the court issued a partial default, essentially. The, the, the default was on the question of liability, just on like, does Alex Jones owe some amount of money to these plaintiffs. And then they had the trial on the damages. And that's pretty common to have separate trials on damages um, if the liability issue is like resolved like this. Um, and so there's some, you know, I've had damages specific trials sometimes if like there's an appeal and the appeal is on the issue of damages, you might go back and you don't retry everything. You just retry the damages part. And then discovery conduct. So discovery, if you don't know what that is, discovery is this process before the trial happens where you get to go get like evidence from each other or from third parties. You get emails, you go take a deposition of the person where they, they testify under oath. Um, you uh, go take a deposition of other random people who might be witnesses. Um, so, so all that is the discovery process. And that is a very contentious process. Sometimes defendants often, 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 I would say not every, well, maybe every time are trying to sort of like, you know, play games and, and waste time and cause issues in discovery and try to keep you from getting evidence if you're the plaintiff. And that's especially in cases where like, you know, you're going to lose your only tactic is to just sort of stall on waste time and stuff. Um, and it, and it lets them build lots of hours, which is what the defendants are paid by the hour. Plaintiffs are usually paid or uh, often, often paid, not always on percentage, which means you don't really have as much incentive to waste time. And so you can see why I get a little irritated by it because I see people do stuff that is really kind of absurd sometimes, um, often <laughs> then, uh, you see, so they're basically the court had earlier in the case issued this sanction, this punishment that Alex Jones, uh, like basically doesn't get to fight the liability. He is liable and they are asking for a new trial on that part of it. They're saying kind of the punishment should fit the trial, the crime, the sanctions can't be ex excessive. Uh, and this is all Texas law. So it can vary. The law on this can vary a lot between states, between federal court and state court. And they say, like, like one example I'm seeing here is that, uh, and I haven't checked this law, so I don't know if this is accurate. Sometimes people don't cite the full law, but they say like courts must consider the availability of less stringent sanctions and whether such lesser, lesser sanctions would fully promote compliance. That's not strictly true in federal court sometimes, or, and it may be, actually maybe even different across different like, uh, circuits. I usually do the ninth circuit. I know that there's some situations where you don't have to consider this, um, but that's, you know, it generally courts will just because that's kind of check the box. I looked at when it says less stringent sanctions, it means like, well, should you go, is what Alex Jones did in discovery severe enough that, um, he, that I should end his case or should I do something like, you know, tell the jury he, he like wasn't producing documents to the other side or wasn't showing up to his deposition or whatever. Um, th those are options you could do. Like, uh, it's called a jury instruction where you're like, you should infer that Alex Jones is hiding stuff from you. And then you let the jury decide, okay, is, is he liable? Um, here the court kind of went and said default. Um, and, uh, there, one, one thing I will note is that there's very different like versions of events of what happened in discovery in this motion versus in what the, 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 the next video we'll be talking about, which is what the plaintiffs say. Um, so they, they kind of are citing more law that is like favorable to them. Like, even if it was an intentional discovery abuse, 
court still has to like consider the lesser sanctions and uh, a conclusive explore, explanation isn't enough. You got to kind of like go into details. You can see they're, these are quoting just like this would be a citation to another legal opinion. Um, and then they're quoting what the other court said uh, in, in the opinion. And because these are appellate courts, those are courts that are a little bit higher up than you can see that's an appellate court in Dallas. That's one in Texarkana. Um, and which is just a place in Texas. Um, then they, they kind of are just making an argument essentially that using these other cases that what Alex Jones did is not severe enough that you should uh, have sanctions. And he's saying basically he didn't really do that much to justify this. We'll, I think we'll get to that in a little bit, in a minute. Um, so they're saying that uh, this, this is a death penalty sanction because it basically means I automatically lose. It's excessive. Yes, we committed sanctionable conduct, which is, you know, admitting that is, you know, <laughs> once you've admitted that, that's a little bad, but it was improper early and unconstitutionally excessive to go this far in punishing us. Um, they say that it, back in 2019, the court ordered ex, ex, expedited discovery, which is like discovery on a quick schedule in the plaintiff's IIED claim. What is IIED? That's an abbreviation for intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is a tort. A tort is a legal theory that is not based in contract where you can sue someone on it. And intentional infliction of emotional distress is a claim where someone did something to you uh, to try to like cause distress to you on purpose emotionally. So that's what they're saying Alex Jones did when he started calling these people crisis actors, saying their kids didn't exist and all this. Um, so he's, the plaintiff is suing under that claim. And that's a real complicated area of law. It's on lots of law school exams because different states have different rules. Uh, some states require you to like a physical Impact is what they'll call it uh, for this type of claim, where you have to actually like, um, like Alex Jones would have had to physically contact the person somehow. Um, some states don't. That's just a, that's another thing that uh, varies a ton in in the law. Um, then this this is their version of what happened, uh, or Alex Jones's version of what happened. They say basically that there was an appeal, an appellate stay. That's a pause in the case. So they say an appeals court paused the case. There was no discovery because of that pause until three months after the stay was lifted. So the, the, the pause goes, is gone. And then now they say, okay, now discovery starts again. Then they say, Alex Jones did give some discovery. Um, he gave them some stuff, some documents or whatever. Um, but then four months after this pause is over, um, the court uh, found that a, the court imposed this uh, default judgment against Alex Jones. Now, four months is a pretty short time in discovery. Um, it, uh, that, doesn't really give a lot of time for like motions or um, if, if the defendant is stalling, it, it makes it like it might have been a strategy intentionally. It's basically like four months is so short that if I just like kind of drag stuff out and, and it's very easy to drag out four months, I can tell you that much. Um, then uh, they may have done that basically trying to be like, oh, now you don't have any documents and you don't have any witnesses. So you don't have enough to win your case. Um, so this says the judge like uh, basically awarded attorney's fees or this default. And Alex Jones is going is saying, oh, well, look, we were this, in this time period, period, there's all this COVID stuff going on, because that is September 2021, although it's not like the height. Well, yeah, it's kind of like where COVID was dying down a little bit, but there still was stuff went on, like, uh, you know, which might have affected the attorneys or whatever. Um, and then it says the sanctions unreasonable because the defendants have given 300,000 pages of documents, 100,000 emails, thousands of text messages um, and financial records and stuff. Uh, that is a lot, although... Sometimes, I think we see this from the plaintiffs a little, uh, defendants will throw around numbers like, oh, I gave you 300,000 pages of documents, and it's very easy to pad that. <laughs> so I, what I see like in nearly every case is defendants will go find something that's like, here's, you know, 300,000 pages of irrelevant stuff that you have, no, has no relation to your case, go dig through it. Sometimes they dump that stuff in on purpose to just be like, here's all my whatever, and they just give you everything they have. Uh, hoping that you won't find anything important in there because all the important stuff is buried inside the 300,000 pages of their other internal documents that have no relation to your case. Um, so I've seen people do that with millions of documents and you <laughs> uh, have to just go in there and start trying to find stuff. Um, so uh, whether this was a real production or not, that's not necessarily indicative of him actually complying with the rules, but also not indicative. It, it does indicate he gave them something. So um, you just can't really tell, I would say, from that number, like like it's kind of meaningless. Uh, on some level. So then they have this section, this analysis, and you'll see there's not really a lot of typos or anything. They were comp the, the plaintiff was complaining about like typos that were an affront to Travis County and its people. And I have not really seen one <laughs> yet, but I, I, I did see one or two earlier, but when I was looking at this before the video, but um, I do think they were a little, uh, 
blowing smoke is maybe the way to put it in terms of how bad this was. Now you will see like if you needed, if we, the more, the further you go into this, the harder it is without an index to go find all this stuff, what he's arguing. Uh, it is actually organized. Um, you, you see this thing when, we, when they talked about him slandering an ex-Supreme Court uh, justice. Um, what I understand from the, uh, the plaintiff's motion is that this, this justice, Craig Enoch, is not actually involved in any of this. And so they're saying he's, they just made this up. How that got in there, I don't know. But we'll, uh, we'll find that out in the second video or maybe because uh, we've got a bunch of uh, opinion, or, uh, motions to go through in a separate series of motions about the sanction stuff. So they kind of basically are arguing uh, in, th in this that the default judgment was wrong. Give me a new trial. That's something that might persuade an appellate court in terms of like how good an issue is on appeal. I don't think it's as clean cut as the punitive damages one. The punitive damage ones, damages one, I do think in Texas, um, I, I think we have a very good chance that it's going to get cut down. New trial on liability. Um, that is a, a type of issue where appellate courts would be a little more willing to look into it. There are certain kinds of issues where they just like don't, they just stay out of it. Um, now sanctions, they will, I think, defer a little bit. Uh, to the judgment of the trial court. In this case, the the political thing might make them change that uh, because um, they may, the judge has even made some comments and stuff on the bench that seemed like she really didn't like Alex Jones uh, or wasn't able to kind of hold back her uh, opinions. And the court might be looking at that going, that is a little, it is kind of an extreme sanction. Um, is this happening because he's Alex Jones or is it happening because he really did something? We, but that's, uh, I don't think it's as clean and I do think that it, he probably, while it's nice to win back the $4 million in terms of how much he's making, it's not like he can get it down. He is probably popping champagne if he gets this from $50 million down to $4 million. I'll say that much. <laughs> so uh, then it says, um, and you start to get into some political stuff. They're talking about Megyn Kelly and Alex, you know, she interviews Alex Jones and attacks him on the airway or airwaves. And um, they're kind of attacking the plaintiffs for not suing them back in 2017 and they, they said they waited because they want revenge on him for his support of Donald Trump and to shut up his 45 million person audience. Um, and then the, they, they were kind of telling, saying the court, like, look, the court was ignoring uh, the, like pro in, things that were going on in, in Alex Jones's business. They say that uh, this company, this is his company, FSS, that's an abbreviation for it, uh, was like lost their credit card access because they were being kind of canceled by everyone. Um, they say they uh, prevented him from fully testifying about the effects of his divorce and COVID on the litigation, and which basically he's saying, like, I was going through all this stuff, and that's why I couldn't kind of fully answer discovery on time, um, which I'm not sure that's a, a great excuse, but it's 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 an excuse. Um, then uh, the court says, and, and the reason I say that is, like, courts are probably not going to, now in four months' time frame, maybe, but courts are really not going to be like, your divorce is enough. They're kind of going to be like, you're in this lawsuit, it's your problem. Um, or maybe you should ask for an extension. I don't know if he did or not. Uh, the docket's very long, so, but uh, that's the kind of thing that they would want to look at. Um, then they say, basically, because you uh, gave me the death penalty on liability, that meant that I couldn't like present evidence that I was not even really the significant one, you know, running around making this, this theory, right? Um, and like part of like what he would be arguing there, you can kind of see is basically saying like, like he would argue, I'm not the one that was, if the plaintiff was damaged for in $5 million amount from his emotional distress, I, Alex Jones, did not cause all of that, right? I, Alex Jones, was running around saying this, but so were a ton of other people. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of people on the internet saying this. And so how much of his distress is really attributed, attributed to me? You know, his, he's going to have had distress from other people saying this. And you're kind of putting all the liability on me when I was not the only one doing it. This is the argument I'm kind of devil advocating it because um, I'll advocate both, you know, uh, or or I guess argue what they will say. Um, and that is what Alex Jones is saying here. And it's not entirely unreasonable to say, hey, should I, you know, was I the, so the sole one? On the other hand, the plaintiffs may say, like, look, you were the biggest because because you saw earlier, he's like, I have an audience of 45 million. So the more you, it is a little tension, right? Like the bigger Alex Jones argues his audience is, the more he's kind of is more responsible for it uh, in terms of like, were these other people saying it, his audience, you know, you don't know if like maybe he spread it to, to his audience. So if I was the plaintiff, that's what I, I would be saying in response to this. We don't have their response to this yet. Um, then this says basically um, the liability sanctions order prevented him from making a free speech defense under the First Amendment. And this is probably, I think, a, 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 a better one a little bit because it's a legal one. And he can argue like 
uh, you know, basically say this was my free speech. It's a defense to to this emotional intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, that's kind of a legal question. Um, even if it did cause dis distress, I'm allowed to like run around saying this stuff about the government because I'm saying the government created this fake shooting to like cause gun control, and that's a criticism of the government or whatever. Um, so he's he's um, would he win that? I don't know uh, it, because free speech does have limits in terms of when you're. If you're literally just making stuff up, you you even though it's a criticism of the government, doesn't kind of insulate it. Um, but then, it it is something that he didn't get a chance to make as an argument. So what he'll argue is like you you auto maybe auto lose, and I should have had this chance to protect this important right. Um, so then he's uh, arguing that this uh, by doing this, it violates his due process rights under federal and Texas law. So due process is a right to like. Whenever there's any kind of hearing, uh, it doesn't even have to be a trial. Um, an example that that where you would have due process rights when it's not a trial is like uh, when a college student gets accused of, say, sexual assault. Um, if you are, if they, like they have those hearings, like at colleges, that's something real controversial. Um, you you would have due process rights because your rights are being taken away, and so you have to like uh, it's kind of quasi governmental, and you you have to be afforded certain things, which is like a fair hearing. You have to be given notice of that hearing and fair hearing just is kind of a general concept that the way, the way the trial occurs or the way the hearing or whatever occurs has to be, has, you can see them list these things, an opportunity to be heard, which means you have to be allowed to make your case a uh, decision made by a neutral decision maker, which means the judge can't be like, I hate Alex Jones. Um, the, the, that would violate your due process rights because the process uh, uh, the procedure that was used to come to the decision, if it, if it's not fair, then you have lost that kind of constitutional right. And that is a constitutional right in the 14th amendment. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this, this, it, it ties kind of back into his other arguments. He's basically arguing your sanction was so severe that I didn't get this. And he also argues like, look, um, he's, he talks a little bit about the media at some point, like how this is like all over the place. It, I think it's at the end, which is part of this organization thing that he, he argues that this was televised and that hurt him. And um, he's going through kind of the legal tests on this for, for what's called procedural due process. There is a, a you get, there's something else called substantive due process, which is a little bit different. Uh, but he's arguing this is about the procedures. And so he cites some other cases. This is from Oregon, uh, but it went to the U.S. Supreme Court and says that um, punitive damages like in that case got reversed because they were... Um, like, let's see here what it says. That the the due process clause in the U.S. Constitution forbids a state to to punish uh, with punitive de uh, damages a defendant for an injury that it inflicts on non-parties or those, those who they, they directly represent, i.e. injury that it inflicts on people who are strangers to the litigation. Uh, now, I'm not sure that's sort of applicable here because it's, um, although here, here's what he's saying. He's saying that... Uh, the evidence that was presented to the jury about the damages involved allegations about damages to people outside the litigation, like the other parents of the Sandy Hook children. So he's what Alex Jones is saying is basically like you you went in here, uh, even aside from this default judgment, you went into the in the trial and you told the jury about all the emotional damage that Alex Jones inflicted, not on the parents who were suing in Texas, but on everybody. And so that would kind of inflame the jury. It might make them think the damages are higher than what they should have been because um, you're punishing him for like, not what he did to these two specific parents, but for what he did to this overall group of parents, many of whom are separately suing him. So you could get kind of like a double recovery in that way. Um, so that, that's kind of the argument here. And then he starts going into Texas law and what Texas law has to say about punitive damages. You can see that this here is talking about uh, this Texas Supreme Court case in which they adopted kind of some what they call guideposts or an exemplary damages award. An exemplary, exemplary damages is just another phrase for punitive damages. Um, and you can see the things that they, they list that have to be kind of considered in order, they say right here, to ensure that the, the award of exemplary damages is not grossly disproportional to the gravity of the defendant's conduct. The gravity of the conduct is the seriousness of the conduct of the defendants. So you have to consider one, the degree of reprehensibility to the, the disparity between the actual damages awarded and the exemplary damages awarded. That's kind of that 10 to 1 ratio we talked about earlier. And three, the difference between the exemplary damages award and the other civil or criminal penalties that could be imposed in comparable cases. So 
I think this is kind of kind of gets to like what one of his best arguments on appeal would be is you start talking about you've got this kind of range where um, the Supreme Court said, look, you could kind of at the most the most reprehensible stuff should generally, uh, unless there's some super extreme case, be like ten to one is like the max you should ever really go uh, to be consistent with due process. And if you step back a little and start asking yourself, like, is Alex Jones at level ten on a scale of ten? It's not really a scale of ten to one, but is he is he like the most reprehensible? person there could possibly be? And the answer, I think, just instantly has to be no, even looking at this case, because um, Adam Lanza, the guy who did the shooting, is the most reprehensible. Like, if you are if you leave it nowhere to go, you're like, Alex Jones sort of coming up with this conspiracy theory is the worst thing that anyone could have done. Well, then what punitive damages would you award if you were suing the guy who actually, like, shot a bunch of children? Um, so I do think that... Um, <laughs> I think there is a gut level like persuasiveness to saying that uh, we shouldn't be at the absolute highest punitive damages for the reprehensibility of this conduct. If you're if you're analyzing like how reprehensible is what Alex Jones did relative to the things people can do, um, or even in this lawsuit, it just doesn't seem like it should have been a ten. Um, where should it be? I don't know, um, but you know. You can't set up this sort of test, and the reason they set up these tests is designed to have sort of like a neutral, fair evaluation of people when you're trying to do punitive damages so that people are kind of on a scale. You're kind of um, putting the most severe awards of, of damages on people who really did do like the most severe stuff and the lesser awards down on people who did not do stuff that's as, as severe. So really, um, on some level, uh, I will say there's there's sort of a – as a plaintiff's attorney, there's – there's a saying uh, among us, or not really a specific saying, but this idea that there's such a thing as winning too much. Okay, so if you win too much, um, it can make it much harder to hold on to what you won on appeal. Um, and sometimes when attorneys go get a four or five hundred million dollar verdict, and I've been on some cases where we've gotten those and held them, um, but this, the second you're getting it, you're going, well, this is this appeal just got a lot harder if I won five hundred million dollars because uh, they're going to be looking at that real closely, and if there's something wrong. Um, you know, there's going to be a gut level like this is too much. Um, so because the, the the Supreme Court and, and the the appellate courts are not going to be looking with this idea of, oh, let's shut down Alex Jones. They're going to be looking at this going not even just the Alex Jones case. What what rules should we have to decide all the cases that we get? And so um, there's another saying, and this is an actual saying that you learn in law school, which is good facts make bad law. Good facts make bad law. And the idea is that when you have a set of facts that's like super good for uh, one position, it, it can sometimes make really bad rules because people, they'll look at someone and they'll be like, I hate Alex Jones. I want to just like nuke this guy. And if you make the rule based on the case where you hate someone and want to nuke them, and it could be someone worse than Alex Jones. It could be, you know, Adam Lanza or something. Um, you, you try to make the rules not just based on the case you're looking at, but on what will this do to all cases where we have punitive damages. And I do suspect given just sort of how Far the the court went here um, appeal that that's part of the reason I think it's likely that in it, definitely in Texas that there's going to be a reduction and that that's kind of the law that would justify that here. Um, they talk about uh, the they're sort of complaining here a little. It's not really a separate argument. They're saying they were denied the right to cross examine witnesses uh, on liability, and then we, our his right to counsel, Alex Jones's right to counsel, was severely interfered with by a constant barrage of sanctions and threatened sanctions against their counsel and them constant. So here's that uh, the first uh, typo I've seen. Although this is not, um, it looks like they just left the word constant on there. This is not a. You, you do end up with typos in briefs, and I will say that a brief like this, you could kind of tell at the beginning that they were like rushing this out to a deadline. A, a month to write this a motion for a new trial is like not long, um, especially at this length. And so, uh, you know, it does seem like there's a threat of sanctions over something minor here that got denied, which we'll see later in the next video. Um, they get to the next uh, uh, thing and it says the court should grant a new trial because the defendant's granting of leave to amend the Fifth Amendment petition was prejudicial on its face, was an unfair surprise, and then was untimely. And so what's what it's talking about here is sort of a maneuver by the plaintiff, which is um, uh, they, they recognize that they have this problem with the Texas. We were talking about that uh, law in Texas that limits uh, punitive damages to $750,000 tops. And I do... You know, even having talked about Alex Jones being an extreme, and this this award being extreme on the the high end, that's pretty extreme on the low end. I think uh, I do think that Texas law is a little bit like limiting it to just seven or fifty thousand dollars can cause justice in a lot of scenarios. Um, it really can defang the ability to to use punitive damages for what they're supposed to be for. 
So personally, I would probably agree with the trial court that um, she she held she said that law was unconstitutional and it's not basically she didn't think it was enforceable. Um, I do think that that would be a good social ruling to let it be more than seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, but uh, you don't really control what <laughs> state governments do sometimes. Um, so, uh, and that's how you can see like a lot of people really. Ending up in the middle on stuff like this is generally better in terms of like creating a rule that's fair for everybody rather than deciding like like this this is the guy who needs to be destroyed, so we're just gonna destroy him anyway. And um this this uh has this um so so what what happened in this case basically is that the plaintiff to try to maneuver around that limit um was tried they amended kind of at the last minute their their uh petition, they're calling it here, or complaint you would call it. Um and you can amend your complaint uh, sort of through uh, really whenever the court will let you. Um, but this says that they basically added a, a, a paragraph that the point of this paragraph is to try to get around that $750,000 damages cap by leading this case into an exception. So there's like some exceptions to this law, um, which is now they're alleging that this was a, a sort of criminal conduct that injured a disabled individual. And th then the reason that they're doing that is that uh, there is like, uh, I guess, an exception in this law for if you, um, on the limit to the cap, if they intentionally are injuring a disabled individual. So they're trying to find ways to like get more punitive damages than what generally would be the law in Texas. And Alex Jones is complaining, saying, look, you did this at the last minute. That's not really fair. You're supposed to get notice. Uh, you see he references notice pleading. So part of the, the, the reason you do these uh, long complaints or whatever complaints in the first place is for the purpose of notice. The idea is that early in the case you should be giving the the plaintiff should be giving the defendant some kind of notice of what they think they're going to be saying. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact, doesn't have to be perfect. You obviously don't know all the facts when you sue. You kind of are to some degree like alleging what you think probably happened, um, and or sometimes even just what might have happened. So the the notice that you're supposed to be giving them is like this is something that I could say. This is a kind of legal argument that I could make. And so Alex Jones is basically saying, by letting them do this at the last minute, I didn't get to prepare for them coming in and saying there was a disabled person, which might, there, that, you know, you would certainly, if you're a defendant, want to go, like, find out, did, was the person actually disabled? Like, what, what kind of stuff is there that uh, uh, might justify this exception? Because that, the effect of that can be a difference between $750,000 and some much, much higher number. See, they're talking about um, exception or exemptions from the statutory cap. Uh, that require them to prove criminal conduct. And so that's why they're alleging Alex Jones violated uh, the penal code is just a phrase for uh, a, a like the law in Texas that, and really anywhere, penal is just punishment. So law that punishes people for crimes. Uh, if you're in Texas, you'll usually learn, spend a lot of time learning this. I had a kind of crazy uh, professor who <laughs> loved the Texas penal code and was like a most Texan guy you can imagine uh, running us through Lots of bar fight scenarios and the, the most insane bar fights you can imagine were always hypotheticals. You know, someone shoots the wall and it ricochets and kills this other person. And then, the, you know, the husband of the wife goes and kills someone else and all this. And you'd have to, like, figure out all the crimes. So it's uh, real complicated, something you study a lot in law school. But if you find a violation, they have a way to try to get around the cap. And the uh, Alex Jones is like, shouldn't have been allowed to do that. That's basically just a maneuver that is not uh, fair to me. And he kind of uh, gets to some legal argument about when you are allowed to make these amendments or not. Um, and these are just some cases about like when people are trying to do like last minute, uh, last minute amendments. And then he's saying basically like if you are pro if you're alleging that Alex Jones violated this penal code and it injured a disabled person, then you have to like there, there's a lot of facts. There's what's called affirmative defenses, which is when the defendant has to can, can go make a defense, but, but an affirmative defense, they have the burden of proof on, the defendant does, uh, whereas usually in a case, the plaintiff has the burden of proof. Uh, so that affirmative defenses are like, I affirmatively have to prove it if I'm a defendant. Um, so they basically say, I got surprised by this. I was prejudiced uh, by it. Um, the burden to show the surprise is on us, Alex Jones. You can see that uh, in any legal issue, there's going to be what they call burdens, which just says who has to sort of edge over um, the 51% mark. Like, is it more likely than not uh, that what I'm alleging is true. And so uh, you'll see in a lot of death things, the burdens will be on one party or the other. And he, now he's sort of talking about all the different evidence that they would have had to show, and they didn't, because this is last minute, he's saying like they didn't even charge the jury on it <laughs> as to what proof. So it, the jury charge is like 
when if you're ever on a jury, the judge will go and um, they'll read this. Sometimes it can be like an hour and a half or two hours, and they're just giving instructions to the jury. Uh, it'll be this very specifically worded thing. They don't add ad lib it. They like both the plaintiff and the defendant will argue a ton about this beforehand. You get this fully written out thing where everyone's like objected to little parts of it. And then the judge reads the whole thing to the jury. Um, and sometimes we'll give them copies of it so that they can read it themselves and have access. That's just various based on the judge and the state. Um, but so they're basically saying the jury didn't even get instructed about this defense or, or about this uh, exception and for disability. And so how, if they're not instructed, could they make these decisions about like, was the person, the parent that Alex Jones supposedly injured intentionally, did they suffer? Um, you can see they had to have uh, like, there's three ways, but you could have serious mental sort of impairment or mental injury, which would be emotional stress would not qualify. Um, but first you got to show they're a disabled person. You got to show that there was severe emotional disturbance. You got to so show um, all this other stuff. And he's like, you didn't even take this to the jury, really. Um, and then they also, let's see, goes through here and starts talking about these different crimes that are exceptions to the cap. Um, and then the question of like, what is severe emotional disturbance? Because that's sort of in and of itself, like, um, does he meet that? Uh, how does it have to be proven? And the plaintiffs are arguing basically like, well, there was, uh, it's, it's from a different motion, it sounds like, but they, they were saying that this went to the jury by consent and that there's no, uh, like, you didn't have a problem with it earlier. Um, he's going through more and more of these instructions. It's sort of, there's a lot of like technical legal back and forth, but you can see it's, uh, this, he, they will get into this. I'm not sure, you know, if he wins the cap, this $750,000 cap is real good for, for him, obviously, because it's just sort of clean. Now he's down to $5 million. You'll probably get there also just based on this, these arguments about you, you exceeded by so much the amount of damages that it, it violates my due process rights. Now, then he could still get stuck with like 5 million, you know, but at 5 million, uh, regular award for actual damages and 5 million for punitive would still hurt Alex Jones because that's an extra 5 million bucks. And you definitely want to fight about that if you can, you know, <laughs> stop it. He's, he's just, I think a lot of this, what I'm looking at now, the reason I'm scrolling through it is this kind of uh, long-winded, <laughs> maybe the way to put it. This is how you get to 50 pages. If I was trying to do a 25 page motion, which you can see they're already right past that. And that's where most courts would allow you in other states or other places that might be the max. Uh, I would be cutting a lot of this because it's just sort of repetitive. Um, and not really um, well honed. It's maybe to put it, maybe would have put it. I don't, I, again, I don't think it is something that is sanctionable, but now they're sort of arguing that they just waited so long and, and it does kind of just repeat all the stuff about that and get into, we're still there. <laughs> it looks like we're still on this, uh, whether there was emotional injury or not and whether it's this criminal cap exception. Still, it's on constitutionality of this cap uh, because they're basically arguing that uh, he, Alex Jones, wants to say the cap is constitutional. Um, he sort of briefly talks about that. Uh, he, they're probably, I, I suspect he's right that courts in Texas have said it is constitutional. I do, but again, I do think like really just even not even on constitutionality, but just policy grounds. That's I think those kind of caps are. Um, it's better to give courts leeway in general on this than and let the appellate courts cut stuff down than to just make some arbitrary cap because you, you end up with a lot of things where certain types of uh, claims like medical malpractice or something is really even in states like Texas gets cuts down pretty dramatically because no one can afford to go do it. And when, if you win, the lawyers don't get enough money to justify doing the lawsuit. And then you start having a lot of medical malpractice. Um, so that's his argument on this uh, damages cap. This part, what Alex Jones uh, is arguing is, is a technicality, but it might be a fatal one, honestly, for uh, the, the punitive damages. And uh, he's arguing that uh, basically that the jury instruction was messed up on the punitive damages section because um, what he's saying is that in Texas, uh, uh, the sentence says defendants cannot be held jointly and severally liable for exemplary damages. So what that is saying, um, exemplary damages is punitive damages. And jointly and severally liable means that there are certain types of liability or certain types of um, uh, torts, I would say, where uh, two different people, or for example, this has Alex Jones and his company, right? So two different people who sort of cooperate in some bad conduct can be held 
uh, jointly and severably liable, which means they are both liable, but for the full amount, no matter how much each of them was responsible. Um, but also only up to the amount in total. So that's a little complex. So I'll give you maybe, maybe an example of it. Let's say Alex Jones and Alex Jones's company, Infowars, that's got a different name, but that we'll just Lego at that. It's easier. Um, each of them together, they injure someone in, like so Alex does a car wreck or whatever uh, for $1 million. They get $1 million in punitive damages. Um, and that's the jury award. Uh, if if it's jointly and severally liable and they go try to collect a million dollars and let's say they get a million dollars from Alex Jones, that's the most they can get. They can't go get more than a million from Infowars. Um, if they get uh, $500,000 from Alex Jones and he's all out of money, they can go get the rest of the $500,000 from Infowars or they can just go to Infowars and get the million from them. Or, um, you, you know, you can... Any combination, basically, like the plaintiff, when they're enforcing their judgment, can just go to either of them. And until they get their full million, you're both on the hook for the full million. And, Al and in that scenario, Alex Jones or any defendant, but he's just he already got his name here in here as an example. So in the example, Alex Jones, let's say he pays the full one million. Um, he could go. Uh, there's something called a right of contribution, which which. Uh, you know, whether it applies here or not doesn't really matter, but that's a concept that sometimes applies in these cases where sometimes the. Like the Alex Jones defendant, if he pays the million, could go sue Infowars for their part of it. And basically, um, it's sort of a, <laughs> my name's Paul, that's between y'all <laughs> scenario for the plaintiff. The plaintiff doesn't care which one of these guys pays. Uh, the two of them can hash out who owes what on the percentages, right? Because they, they're allowed to go to each other and be like, that one, you know, you, no, you, no, you. Um, but the that's not the plaintiff's problem when it's jointly and several severally. That's the defendant's problem. To figure that out and the plaintiff just goes and gets the money until they get their their total award from any combination that's joint and several liability um what alex jones is saying is that um the jury instructions basically lumped them together and did not have the the uh jury to decide separate punitive damage amounts for um the different defendants here which is alex jones and his corporation and then he's saying the case law requires that a defendant cannot be punished for the acts of another defendant because punitive damages are awarded in part to deter behavior. Therefore, juries are required to judge the effect of the award on each defendant based on a number of factors. So if they, the jury just got this you know, single charge that lumped everyone together, then they're not actually doing that determination, and the award is not, that's for both of them, is not like assessed. Basically, they would not have gone through the grounds that we were looking at earlier of like, oh, is this, you know, how much is Alex Jones's net worth? How much is his company's net worth? How much... Does this, do we need to impose to deter his company versus how much do we need to uh, impose to deter him? And they are, as a, legally, they are separate entities. Um, and so he's saying, look, you messed that part up. Um, that, whether that works or not, I don't know. Uh, but it is something that uh, could be an error that sort of messes up the whole thing or makes them go redo it or whatever. Um, then we get to, um, he asked for a new trial because it says the behavior complained of did not mean meet the legal standards outlined by the courts. And this is one thing where, like, I do agree a little bit that this heading, like, is sort of, uh, like, it is a little hard to follow sometimes. Like, what is he about to argue here? Um, but he's now he's talking about sort of what level of rude behavior or insensitive or, like, calling names or whatever is enough to be so outrageous that uh, you can have emotional distress damages and intentional infliction of emotional distress. So he's citing some examples of other people who didn't. Uh, rise to the level because they usually don't like, like it says here you don't allow like a, a just an insult like a threat an annoyance a petty oppression a triviality um if it's if it's sort of minor or not extreme and outrageous then you don't do it so um he's saying like look i did say that you weren't real and your kids weren't real but this that was not so extreme that it justifies to rise to this level of intentional uh, inflection of emotional distress um what he's doing here is kind of a weird scenario that probably like like that's a strange thing to be saying about someone and so there probably is not a lot of case law directly related to that but they're talking about like firing someone wrongfully allegating against employee doesn't does not rise to it uh, insulting and screaming at an employee does not rise to intentional infliction emotional distress um it's hard to tell what these cases were saying because they're they're just sort of flipping a little descriptions of it um then they say, so you can see we were talking earlier about does it have to have physical harm? It looks like this is one something they consider, but not uh, dispositive, like it doesn't decide the issue entirely. Um, but certainly physical harm is going to be more 
likely to cause distress and more extreme than just like insulting somebody. Um, they talk about this, uh, you know, was the conduct like indifferent or reckless to their safety or their health? Was the target financially vulnerable? Um, was it like repeated actions or just a one-off? Uh, was the harm malice, intentional malice, trickery, deceit, or mere accident? So these are all things they're supposed to be like kind of considering. Now you could, I think you could, in terms of getting a new trial, uh, I'm not sure this wins sort of on its own, right? Like, because he got defaulted on the liability stuff and that this all falls within the question of is he liable or not? So it's almost sort of a, this, that's part of why it's probably at the back of the brief. Generally, you know, a lot of times if you have the most powerful argument, you stick it at the front. Um, if he didn't even get to contest liability, then it's sort of, uh, all this stuff doesn't really matter. He may be arguing as, as a matter of law, my conduct cannot be uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. I'm not sure that's right. At least it seems to me like you could make a pretty good argument that this is rising to something more serious than like an insult. Um, weird, but it, in the context of someone having their kid killed, uh, you probably, <laughs> it seems more likely to cause distress is maybe the way to put it. And so I'm not sure this argument to me is as persuasive as some of his punitive damages arguments. Um, and, and the reason is because when you're at least on appeal, not just sort of the gut feeling of it, but you are generally on appeal looking at uh, um, the, the standard can vary, but um, it, it's kind of like, could no jury find that what he did was so extreme to the intentional infliction of emotional distress? And I'm not sure that's really true that like nobody could think that fairly. Um, once he's admitted, yeah, I know that this was not a conspiracy now and I shouldn't have said it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then they also, it looks like there's some other stuff that they're, they have in there that uh, Alex Jones is alleged to have incited people who did this stuff, like yelling Alex Jones and driving past, past the parents' house, and then they heard gunshots. And But that's just sort of some testimony. Although, like, what else would you have as proof, really? Um, but then Alex Jones would probably say, I'm not the one that did that. Um, so, but then the plaintiffs would say, but you <laughs> made everybody think that I was this crisis actor. Um, so it is always back and forth, um, but I, I don't think it's this is as clean for an for an appeal. Maybe if he got to do the trial, and that 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 leads to the separate issue issue of should he have been defaulted. But um, there's really something that should go to the jury probably to kind of have them. If the default wasn't proper, and if it was proper, then uh, he, this issue is kind of dead. I think. Um, should then he says the court should grant a new trial because the plaintiffs didn't establish that there was. No alternate cause, an alternative cause of action would provide a remedy for the severe emotional distress. Um, and you can see that this, so this emotional distress law, like it's, it's so varied with the states, but the Texas Supreme Court that says considers that tort to be a gap filler. What that means is like, it's only there available if there's no other way legally for you to kind of recover for the damage. So if you're in a scenario where you can't find another, like a uh, tort is what they call it, or a cause of action, there's no other, other legal theory that would get you recovery, but you have been damaged, then this is like the, this fills the gap. It's it's there to let people have a way to sue if there's no other way to. And he's saying, look, there's other things that you could, like, could have sued me on. Uh, let's, setting some cases saying that you have to share something else. And like this one where there was another theory called bystander recovery. Um, this one where there were claims, there are torts called nuisance and assault. Uh, he's saying, well, you you filed a defamation claim, and so just by doing that, you've shown that there's an alternate way to recover because you say I defamed you, and so the same thing I did, the the conduct, the the thing that I did, would if you accept what the plaintiff is saying is true, would be both defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress, and that means under this sort of gap filler theory, there's no gap, there's defamation uh, that 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 gives you your protection, and so you don't go off to this sort of backstop claim. Um, that's something. Uh, that only kind of gets you part of the way, right, though? Because if you win on one claim and then the plaintiff wins on defamation, well, then you're still stuck. Um, then they say, give it to a new trial because the plaintiff's testimony on net worth should be struck. So one of the things you, that happens in uh, punitive damages cases is you're supposed to consider the net worth of the defendant because you um, you need to kind of like, the whole idea behind punitive damages is to like punish someone in a way that stops them from doing the conduct again. And one of the things to consider is like, okay, if your net worth is $1,000, um, then a punitive damages award of like $5,000 or something is really going to like, you you are going to be stuck paying that. You probably don't have a job that can make pay that easily. Um, it, it's a pretty severe punishment for you. 
if your net worth is $100,000, then $5,000, you'd be like, whatever, great. I'm just going to go start making up conspiracy theories or whatever I'm doing. <laughs> like, you know, and if it's your net worth is $2 million, then a $5,000 award, you're going to just laugh or, or not care. Um, and so, um, the, but if your net worth is 2 million, you might, the jury might want to set the award at, you know, a million so that now you've half your money's gone. You did this, something that we consider so severe, uh, that you like, that's what we need to do to punish the guy who's a millionaire versus the guy who has a thousand dollars. Um, and they may decide less. They may say like, oh, well, look, um, a hundred thousand dollars enough or whatever, but they're supposed to consider it so they don't go too far. The idea is that the jury should not be putting a million dollar award on someone with the five thousand dollar net worth and they like working for for fifteen dollars an hour or something because that is what it's too much it's too extreme the person you're you're punishing them with a year's salary or something or whatever it's that that could be enough to stop it um what their answer is it doesn't really say but you have to consider it he's he's saying that the uh there was expert testimony an expert is um you do a trial on a lot of issues you'll have uh, someone who is designated as an expert witness. There's a whole process for that. There are a whole bunch of rules about who can be an expert, uh, who is not an expert. Uh, actually, when I one of my most interesting cases I ever worked on uh, when I was on the, I told you all earlier that I, I did it like in law school, I worked for a, a judge just for one semester uh, on this third court of appeals, uh, the appellate court that will be first deciding this appeal before it goes to the Supreme Court. And I really worked on one case mostly, which was about who could be an expert and the question was, who could be an expert on myotonic goats or fall down goats is the name of the goats. So they literally, you'll go find someone that was about goats falling into electric fences and, and, and like all the goats, I guess someone had installed the electric fence wrong. If you don't know what a fall down goat is, I'm going on a real aside, but I, this was one of my favorite cases to work on a, a fall down goat or myotonic goat. If you scare them, uh, they have this, there, there's some, some gene or something in them that makes them totally stiffen up and the goat will literally just fall down. And so uh, someone had installed an electric fence for myotonic goats, and when the goats fell, they, they did not, they just couldn't get off the fence, and so all these goats were dying. Um, and there was a lawsuit about that, and then the whole question was, uh, who is qualified to be an expert witness on fall-down goats? Uh, and, you know, <laughs> there's all questions you have to ask, like, you know, do, you know what kind, what is the typical standard of expertise for an expert on fall down goats who what does that person look like do they have a degree are they like a rancher like you know who are they who who's going to know uh the kind of like scientific or uh you know factual information that would inform the jury on the question of how do you install an electric fence for fall down goats uh so that was my case but then any case like net worth you would be like uh does this person have sort of generally accepted experience it's a less crazy or ridiculous, but uh, are they experienced in like financial analysis or uh, accounting or things like that? And so you first sort of figure out like, what's their, what, what should the expertise be? And then does this person have it? And then, so he's saying their expert uh, testimony was like not reliable and that there's always fights about expert testimony. Is it reliable? Is it not? Um, and they say there's always financial reports to testify about his net worth and FSS is his company, the official name or, or the abbreviation. And they, they say that uh, his net worth was $270 million according to the expert. Um, probably why there's this dispute about it is because um, when you're trying to determine someone's net worth when they own a company, that's really like vague. Because what is the company worth? The company probably doesn't have $250 million, but it, it, trying to sell it, it might be worth more because uh, a company that makes like, say, $5 million a year, someone might pay, they're not going to pay just $5 million. They might pay... It depends on the industry. They might pay 15 million. They might pay 50 million. Um, and so the bigger the net worth, the more the punitive damages award. Alex Jones is saying, you came in with this sort of crazy net worth. That's not really my net worth. I don't really have it. You're just like making up stuff. Um, and that influenced the jury. Um, doesn't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, you can see that's probably not his main argument when we get to the appeal, which has not been filed yet. But And then it says, he's back to the Damages Act, which is this act on the $750,000 uh, cap. He's saying uh, the, the court or the verdict ignores it. Uh, the exceptions don't really apply here for this disability stuff. This is like, this is what the act's talking about, that the generally punitive damages in Texas are limited to the greater of one of these two things. One, uh, up to $750,000, uh, like that's the max, or two, $200,000. Um, and that first part doesn't really matter because he's just well past that. Um, so He's saying, like, look, you ignore this, like, real basic law here, and uh, 45 million is more than 750,000. So, um, 
then this uh, talks about some other stuff, like you're supposed to look to other cases and see what, how, where this falls among the scale of sort of bad things that people do. Um, and he wasn't allowed to present mitigating uh, evidence. Mitigating evidence is evidence that shows um, that this tends to show it's less severe than what you say it is. So um, it says he can introduce two types of this mitigation evidence on punitives, evidence of the profitability of his misconduct. So did he really like make money by spreading conspiracy theory and evidence that he, uh, there were other cases where he has paid a settlement or um, like had a jury award. And, and Alex Jones is being sued in multiple different places, Connecticut and Texas. And so he's like, I didn't get a chance to present this stuff. Um, and he says, uh, this is one of the organizational things. Like you're, it's kind of repetitive. I, I again, not sanctionable. I don't think, which is why the court didn't sanction him for, uh, as you'll see in the next video. But uh, it, like, why are you having two sections on the same thing? It's it's kind of a waste of time. Um, they don't really seem to be that distinct. And if it's the same issue, you really should to make it easier for the court. You want to merge it together. You want an index. You want uh, this stuff to be organized logically. Um, it is probably a rush job relatively in terms of 50 pages, um, but I, I, I'll just say I wouldn't move for sanctions over the one spelling error I've seen and the, the and, and just like the mess. Um, he says, um, then he gets to defamation. He says that uh, the, the evidence was legally insufficient to show that there was defamation for this, this parent. Uh, one, he's saying it's past the uh, statute of limitations, which is one year. Um, but then like, he doesn't get into too much detail. He basically says there's some ways that that can be extended. And then he just doesn't really argue it. He says that, uh, he's a broadcaster. So he has this, like what's called a qualified privilege. Broadcasters are people who uh, usually would be like the evening news. Um, it's real, but it's actually in Texas. Look, you can see it here. It's real narrow An owner, licensee, or operator of a radio or television station or network of stations. I uh, may not qualify as that. He's like a website. Um, Kind of a modern version of a television station, but the law doesn't really, the legislature has to change it itself really for that to change. Um, he says reporting third party allegations that are a matter of public of concern or not defamation. So that would be sort of like um, what I'm doing here, right? Like when I start saying, hey, look, this uh, plaintiff said that Alex Jones lied about the conspiracy theory, um, this is, that would, there's an exception to let you basically like talk about the news so that you aren't getting sued. So that I don't get sued if I go start talking about someone and I'm, I'm not really, I'm not alleging that this happened. I'm, I have no idea really what anybody said um, or whether it was true or not. I have no idea who's a crisis actor and who's not. I have my personal opinions and suspicions about that, but that probably they were not crisis actors because everyone's admitted it now. But in another case, you might be a news station, like talking about something. Like if you go look at other videos I do, um, there, there are people saying stuff that, may or may not be true and reporting to two people or telling them, look, that guy is saying this, here's my commentary about it. Um, this is a Texas law saying that's not defamation. And that makes sense because otherwise you really couldn't even talk about a lawsuit, even if it's something where like it's a public thing. And this certainly is a public thing. People should be able to express their opinions about like what Alex Jones did or what's alleged about it. Um, if you start coming in and saying something that's like, it's different if I were claiming to have some personal knowledge of something, if I were like, oh yeah, I know that he you know, like he hit somebody or something like just something made up. Um, that is like sort of outside the, the commentary. But when you do a video like this or when it goes on the news or when like what he, what Alex Jones is saying is I was doing something like this. I'm doing something like what Kevin was doing. I'm reporting on these people. I didn't, I'm not saying you're a crisis actor. I'm reporting on all these people who were saying it. Um, now, I don't know. It's sort of, there, there are times when that can go like past it, right? And I'm not sure the details of all these specific ones, if it's enough to, he, he's not really giving what the court would need to sort of conclude that he was just like rebroadcasting. He's talking about this, this uh, zero head, just like a website that uh, says he was like talking about. Um, but there's also ways when you can sort of go beyond that. Um, what he did, what he did, he says the defamation is two videos and five minutes of video that plaintiff never saw. And um, it's just, whether he fit within this, he's not really explaining to the court. Here's why specific statements I made are a rebroadcast. He's just asserting it, uh, which probably is not, probably just sort of checking the box to preserve it. Then he says he wants this one witness um, struck. It's, it's an expert witness again. She relied on an opinion poll that was not uh, reliable. Um, that's what you get into a lot of, uh, like it's the kind of argument you see for, for experts. Um, 
you, there's a uh, the federal version of this is called Daubert. Uh, Daubert is a case that sort of established that you have to have a scientific methodology to be an expert. Um, and so he's saying basically like it has to be reliable. And he's saying like an opinion poll, which is probably true or not reliable. That doesn't necessarily make the whole expert report wrong, but um, it can be a reason to reject the expert. Um, get to next here is something called an appeal bond. And this is something... Um, a lot of defendants don't know this exists, and you probably should know it exists. Uh, it's different for federal and state, but uh, <laughs> a lot of them think, oh, I'll just go appeal. Um, you don't always get to appeal that easily. Um, so uh, an appeal bond, it's also called a supersedious bond, is a court, whenever you've won a, a verdict um, and you have a judgment, a judgment is this a document the court signs is like, you win. You can now take this piece of paper and go take stuff from someone. Um, what the defendant wants to do is, oh, I'm going to appeal. Um, and then they want to obviously not have their stuff taken while, while they're appealing. Um, the problem is for defendants that they don't realize is that um, to, in order to, it's a separate question of, do I get to appeal? That's one thing. Do I get to stop the plaintiff from taking all my stuff while, while the appeal is going on is a different question. And what courts will often do, uh, it's, it's very common, is to require the defendant to put up what's called an appeal bond. Uh, that is money that is just like stuck, locked away. And the court says, I'm going to let them just go start enforcing that judgment while they're, while you're appealing, unless you put up a bunch of money to make sure that, that this judgment gets paid off if you lose your appeal. And the reason for that is like most appeals lose. Okay. Uh, that is, that is the reality. Uh, especially when you're asking for a new trial, most of, most of the time, not all the time, but I would say like from working, uh, it's a little skewed because, uh, like prisoner, there's a lot of prisoner appeals and those are very, very hard in civil cases is a little more likely, but, um, prisoner appeals would probably be like a 99% denial uh, or something insane like that. Um, civil appeals, new trials are very rare, at least that I've seen. Um, the, like the other issues, like cutting down a, 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 a verdict, a jury award is not as rare because that's easy to do without like wasting a bunch of time. Um, so the, the court saying, hey, it was too much is much more likely than hey, you get a new trial. Um, but the appeal bond, like, can the defendant might have to put up, you know, this says, like, not more than half of his net worth uh, for the state law. Federal law could be, like, if it was federal, the court could have said, put the whole 50 million up. And you got to stick that, either you put it up or you go get a bond company, like a bail bond type place. There's, there's, they're not bail bond companies, but there's some companies that will put this up, but you got to put up collateral. And so, um, you m might have to lock up your assets in order to let the, uh, to, to get your right to appeal. Uh, or, I mean, you get it, but then like the plaintiff might be running around, taking your cars, taking your house, taking whatever while you're, while you're busy trying to fight the verdict. Um, so th this is saying that basically the appeal bond was, it's only a paragraph, so I don't think they're really making a big deal about it, but just so you know what it is, he's saying you like, you, you put my net worth at $270 million and then the Texas law says you can't make me put up more than half that, but then that's not really my net worth. My real net worth is negative billion plus dollars because he got this other verdict that was uh, 1.4 billion. Uh, so he's basically saying, I don't have 400 million. I have whatever. I have a negative net worth of more than a billion because of that other uh, uh, judgment. I think it's a verdict. I don't, I don't think they've got to judgment yet. Um, then the it says the court should uh, grant a new trial because they... Uh, this is the broadcast thing I was talking about earlier. Basically, it's unfair because this was on camera and the jurors could let you know. Uh, that just happens. Like if you put stuff on camera, then pe the jurors are like out in public and they're worried about like, what will people think if they vote for Alex Jones or whatever? And then they just, okay, they're done. So that's the, that's the end of that. You can see lawyers put these little signature lines on and then you've got certificates of service, which just say, I gave this to all these people. So that uh, is Alex Jones's 50 page motion for a new trial. I think it helps us learn, know a lot about what uh, the appeal that he's likely to file is going to be what are the reasons he's going to file for this appeal uh and we'll we will talk about that whenever it happens he hasn't done it yet uh next video that i'm going to do that i was referencing is going to be about this motion for sanctions that has uh, gone back and forth and the court has said no sanctions on alex's lawyers it's all about this motion and whether it was a total disaster or not and we'll see what they have to say about that about the typos and about this supreme court justice being talked about and all that uh, if you want to watch that and i'll probably be doing a series of videos about these alex jones cases trying to focus on sort of um bite-sized pieces is maybe the way to put it. You can probably already see this video ends up, ended up being pretty long as my videos do. I'm trying to give you all sort of a detailed, like 
uh, explanation of all this where everyone, even if you have no idea what the law is, you can understand these. Uh, if you want to click on more, there'll be floating click buttons for different videos up here and hit subscribe if you want to go get many more videos like this about different celebrity cases or legal questions or all type of stuff that will give you like a YouTube legal education, more interesting topics than, than you might see in law school.